Uh, the username is, or the, the network is WS Guest. The username is nothing, no characters, nothing, zero, zilch, nada. And the password is Visby Strand with a W for those of you who are not Swedish. Because <laughs> uh, we spell it, apparently we spell it with a V, so we get confused by that, right? Is that it? 12. Visby Strand, swearing 12, excuse me. All right, sorry about that. Hi there. My name is Tom Abernathy. Uh, I'm a narrative designer at Microsoft Studios. Um, I am probably best known for my work uh, on the first two trial humans games. I wrote the first one. I was the lead writer on the second one. Uh, I was the lead writer on Saboteur for the first three years of its development, and I also was one of the two principal writers on Halo Reach, in addition to a bunch of other stuff. <coughs> um, and my session is a bit of a, an enlargement of a session that I first gave at GDC in San Francisco a couple of months ago as part of the Game Narrative Summit, uh, of which I'm an advisory board member. So for those of you who are not game narrative people, sorry, this is sort of game narrative skewed, but I think hopefully you'll enjoy it anyway. Um, in the previous Game Narrative Summit that we had at our last time in Austin last October that was run by Lee Alexander and Matty Bryce and um, Jen Frank, uh, but they were journalists and academics, and um, so we, the board, sort of felt like it was a really important thing to try to speak to some of the issues that they were trying to touch on in that talk, but not from an academic point of view, from a commercial point of view, from a business point of view, because, of course, most of us, most of you, eventually, if you're not already, that's the world that you're going to be living in and working in. Um, because... The fact of the matter is, when you talk about diversity as a goal, as something to aspire to, um, a lot of the time, people in this industry will point to business reasons as justifications not to do it. Whether you're talking about diversity among staff, whether you're talking about diversity among characters in your games, whatever. Um, that gets used as a rationale to stay away from that stuff a lot. And I sort of think that's kind of perverse. So I put this presentation together. Um, to talk about why making conscious choices to create a more diverse cast of characters in your game narrative equals more players. It's an empirical fact. And of course, that means higher revenues, more dollars, all that kind of stuff, which means you get to make more games. And that's the ultimate goal, right? You want to keep making games. So let's jump in with what I hope will be an easy question. And that is, what's wrong with this picture? Or while we're at it, this picture aside from the fact that they have a few of the same characters in them. See anything in common between them? These are, by the way, these are, these are pictures that I took from articles that had been done, top ten lists that various uh, websites did of the, the most important game characters of all time. You will notice that among the humans, I'll leave out the non-humans, um, there is a, uh, a consistent thread of them being male, a consistent thread of them being mostly Caucasian, pasty dead guys count double, so that's good, you get more points for that. Um, this is our history to this point for this medium. Okay, this is our legacy. Now, even in this room, it was more true in San Francisco, but even in this room, if you look around the room, do you see a group of people who look like that? Taking away the armor and the, and the weapons and all that kind of stuff, right? Of course you do not. Because even the group of us who make games are more diverse than that, you know? Um, it doesn't match the diversity of those of us who make games. It doesn't match the diversity of those of us who write games. And the big question, of course, is does it match the diversity of those of us who play games? Because if it does not, if our audience is more diverse than this, then that's a problem. That's something we need to deal with. And this issue becomes a no-brainer. Oh, there was another one. Sorry about that. Now, the problem is that until recently, <clears throat> excuse me, we lacked hard numbers, hard data to be able to talk about this subject intelligently. We didn't have hard numbers on what the makeup of our audience was, gender-wise, ethnicity-wise, sexual orientation-wise. So while the world around us has been looking more and more like this, well, maybe not like that exactly, but at least like this, the world reflected in the games that we made looked more like this. Or maybe this. 
which is supposed to be satirical, so it shouldn't be looking like that anyway, right? The fact is that the world, and by the way, in this talk, when I say the world, mostly I mean America, because that's what Americans do, right? Um, <clears throat> But truly, the world at large is changing, the Western world anyway, right? Actually, it's already changed. It's still in the process of evolving, but it's already changed a lot. And we just haven't been doing a very good job of keeping up. So, when it comes to gender and ethnic and sexual orientation diversity in your game narrative and its cast of characters, there are at least three good reasons for your game and your company and your industry to change with it. The first is moral. It's the right thing to do. Anybody know that movie? Not me. Okay, good one. Thank you. Uh, that's do the right thing, by the way, Spike Lee. Uh, look, everybody has the, the same right to see characters in their entertainment, especially player characters, heroes, who look like them, that those of us who are white and male in this culture have always taken for granted. And that's something that most of us who are white and male, by the way, have, don't often think about. Like, it doesn't occur to us necessarily until somebody points it out to us. And then you start to think about it, and you're like, oh, wow, that's true. All my life, growing up, those are the heroes on my screen. Indiana Jones, James Bond, Han Solo. You know, pick them. That's pretty much what they looked like. The problem is, of course, that in a business context, and sorry, students, I'm going to be talking about business context because that's what this talk is about. In a business context, the moral argument, sadly, tends to be the least persuasive. I've heard marketing executives, even female ones, argue against making player characters female because they assumed, in the absence of actual data, that the core audience, quote unquote, wouldn't stand for it. I guess Laura Croft and Femship don't count. Okay, so be it. The moral argument is not persuasive. so. Since our goal is to figure out how best to persuade, we will spend the least amount of time on this argument. <clears throat> the second argument is creative. And this one's a biggie, as far as I'm concerned. It opens up possibilities for narrative richness, complexity, addictability. It makes your narrative juicy, which means more people are going to dig it more, and you're going to sell more games. And again, that's the goal. There are abundant examples of this. Uh, the recent renaissance in America, and I'm sure you guys have seen some of that, and you've, got, you've had some of it over here as well, I know, and my examples are going to be from North American television, I apologize. But uh, the recent renaissance of long-form television storytelling with prominent, incredibly complex female characters and protagonists like Carrie Matheson from Homeland and Alice Morgan from Luther and pretty much the entire female cast of Game of Thrones, um, you know, ha has had a big impact on me, particularly in the way that I've thought about this issue. There are even actually in America two, count them, two U.S. broadcast network dramas featuring protagonists who are black women, whereas before last year there had never been one. Now, they're both created by the same woman, Shonda Rhimes, who is a black woman. She can't do it all by herself, but still, it's a step in the right direction. And then I think about Skyfall. Even a series as long-lived and hetero-male identified as James Bond films recently served up its best-reviewed and biggest box office hit ever with an installment featuring an unapologetically ambisexual villain. Now, I know that's been a problematic trope in the past, but I actually love how they subverted it in this movie. I love how uh, that, that little interaction with Sylvan Bond when they first meet, um, and, and Silva puts his hand on his knee and says, there's always a first time, and Bond says, what makes you think this is my first time? Right? I mean, you're talking about like, like the <laughs> paragon of white male heterosexual machismo, right? And he's saying he's okay with bicurious, that's not a problem for him. That's a step forward, you know? Uh, it gave us a multiracial money penny who was bought, sorry, spoilers, if nobody's seen it yet, sorry about that. Um, uh, that she's money penny, not that she's multiracial, that's pretty obvious. Um, <clears throat> but she's, she's every bit Bond's equal in the field. And of course, the core of the film is that deliciously Oedipal relationship with Dame Judi Dench's female M, 
the character at the murky center of its plot and themes. And of course, M was not female in the books. And personally, I'm a little disappointed that the new M, much as I love Ray Fiennes, is going to be male again, because I really love Judy Dench. I thought that was a great choice. But the point is, the creative and box office success of these projects, as far as I'm concerned, is no accident. <clears throat> it is fueled by the creative ingenuity provided by the open minds that made these choices. I mean, we've got movies about video game characters that have more interesting female video game characters than video games have, right? That's a problem. So that brings us to the, the third reason, and let's be frank, this is the only one that is really going to matter to most developers or publishers, and that is, it's smart business. And by that I mean there is hard data to indicate that, everything else being equal, you will attract more players, sell more games, and make more money when you add more gender and ethnic diversity to your game's cast of characters. S small aside, LGBT diversity matters too, absolutely, but to this point, I can't find any hard data on it. So it's not a big part of this talk, and I'm sad about that. As soon as I find some, or if you know of any, please send it to me and I will put it in. So, now let me be clear before I go forward and respond to some of the criticisms of my, the first time I gave this talk, who said that, hey, you know, I don't care if a, the character I'm playing looks like me, that's not important to me. Okay, that's fine. What we're really talking about here is choice. Right? And, I mean, honestly, ga great gameplay is supposed to be all about choice. That's supposed to be the, the, you know, North Star that we always use to guide everything that we do. Great gameplay is supposed to be about player agency. The wider and more diverse a range of in-game choices that we give players, the happier they're going to be, right? That's taken as an axiomatic truth in this business, so we can't just decide to not believe it anymore when it's inconvenient for us. And obviously, if you've got a well-established player character that's part of the appeal, like a Lara Croft or a Nathan Drake or a Sean Devlin, for those of you who are Saboteur fans, that's a different thing. That's a, that's a defined character where part of the appeal is I'm getting to play the defined character. You know, I get to be James Bond in GoldenEye. That's fun. That's part of the, that's part of the fantasy. But in situations where a specific identity a specific gender or a specific sexual orientation or ethnicity is not essential to the narrative of the gameplay, why wouldn't we want to give players the same spectrum of choices we work so hard to make available to them in every other aspect of a game experience? Yes, sometimes it's going to cost a little more. Yes, sometimes it's going to add a little bit to the schedule. But the payoff is pretty clearly worth it. We wouldn't want to do that. Why not? Because it wouldn't be good business. Now, this may seem an odd tack to take, because as I said, people always use business impact as the justification for not making entertainment more diverse, not just in our business, other businesses too, movies, television, book publishing. They say, oh no, we can't do that, we can't do that, we might offend our core audience. Now see what they did there? That was sneaky. There's an, there's an assumption inherent in that statement that is buried so deep they may not even realize that it's there. And the assumption is that our core audience is what? Male. White. For that matter, straight. That's the assumption. And that assumption, which as I said before, is rooted in a per perception of what Western society looks like that may or may not bear any actual resemblance to reality in 2013, that assumption suffices to keep the business people in our industry from ever doing any digging to find out if it's actually still true. If it ever was, to the extent that conventional, conventional wisdom would suggest. The fact is, another spoiler alert, it's not true. The fact is, the business case you need to persuade people that this stuff is okay, that it won't hurt sales, that it might actually help sales, <laughs> That case does, in fact, exist, if you dig a little. So let's go digging. Now, before we get into the numbers, there is one assumption at the beginning I am going to make, one small little leap of faith. I mentioned earlier, for which we don't have a lot of data, although I have some anecdotal evidence to show later, but which is pretty intuitive, and that is this. People like seeing characters who look like them in their entertainment. And in games, all things being equal, people like having at least the option of playing player characters who look like them. And the more options we give them, the better. Now, I don't think this is a radical notion, 
But I know that there are people who will push back on it. There are people who have already pushed back on it to me. I mean, for example, uh, there was that article a couple of months ago in Games Industry Biz, and you guys might have heard more about this because it happened on this side of the pond, um, about Don't Not Entertainment's game, uh, Remember Me. Anybody read about that, right? And how apparently a lot of publishers that they talked to refused to seriously discuss publishing the game if they didn't change the gender of their player character because their player character was female. So the publishers were saying, nope, it's a non-starter. You change that or we're not even, even going to talk to you about it. Now, I've witnessed that conversation many times in rooms with marketing people, with business people. And nobody in the room, of course, admits <laughs> to being against making player characters non-male or non-white. And honestly, I think most of the time they mean that. I think in terms of their personal values, they don't. That's not something they'd want to do. But they're scared because they don't know how to defend a choice like that to their bosses. And any shred of data to the contrary gives them cover not to have to. So by the way, those of you who are still in school, enjoy this freedom, because when you get out of here, you're actually going to have to start making choices based on a lot of different criteria than the ones you're doing now. But the thing is, it's not a known fact, right? These people will say things like, well, tell me if you've ever heard this one before. Girls will watch movies or read books or play games about boys, but boys won't watch movies or play games or read books about girls. It's a known fact, right? I've heard, I've heard that multiple times. I mean, I don't doubt there were other reasons it took Pixar 13 movies to have a female protagonist, but I bet nobody at Disney was pounding down their door for one. It's not a known fact. It's an assumed fact. For example, I was on a project that got canceled, sadly, not too long ago, where uh, the game had originally been, been designed with a male player character, but there was no good reason that you couldn't have a female player character as well. The, the main character was not so crisply defined and important that you had to go with that. And so I and some other people on the team were sort of arguing for <coughs> building a female player, player character option. And the executive producer on the project, who was a great guy and, and, and very responsive to that, he said, cool, and he turned to our, our marketing person and said, can, do we have any numbers that we can use to justify the extra expense and the extra time that that's going to add to the schedule? Because it, it was a tight schedule already. And she went digging, and she came back, and the only thing she could find was data for answers from a voluntary questionnaire that had been sent out to Gears of War 3 players over Xbox Live which is not exactly what I would call a scientific poll, if you think about it, right? <clears throat> and what she said basically was, well, only about a third of the Gears of War players are female, uh, and of the males, less than 25% say having a female player character option is important to them, and of the females, less than 50% say that having a female player character option is important to them, so you put that all together and no, it's not worth it. She said, I recommend against it. Which really kind of chapped my hide, I gotta tell you. I mean, if she had just pre presented the numbers as unscientific as they were and left it there, le left it for us to make our own decision, I think the people in the room would have gone, okay, that, you know, that's, we're gonna do it. We'll go for it. But, but then she had to go that extra step because she was covering her own ass and say, I recommend against it. And of course, that gave all the people in the room who were scared, who might have wanted to do it, but were scared to do it, it gave them just enough of a nudge backwards to keep it from happening. And the fact is that there really has been actually very little effort put into finding out if that's really true, what she said. I know, I've looked for the purposes of, of getting data for this talk. I looked hard. The idea that females and people who aren't white are more sanguine about consuming entertainment that's largely populated by white males is conventional wisdom with essentially no solid evidence to support it. Although you will hear it quoted in Hollywood particularly as an axiomatic truth all the time. And God knows anybody who tries to talk about this issue on a moral basis gets slammed on comment boards, right? People will say things like, it's unrealistic to have a female player character. They're not strong enough. They're not physically imposing enough because internet trolls all look like Marcus Phoenix, right? <laughs> and 
And then anonymous internet white dudes start complaining that the very idea is discriminatory against them because it violates their desire and right to have a player character who looks like them, which kind of proves my point although that irony is usually lost on them. But the fact is, data is starting to emerge, which supports my leap of faith. <clears throat> There's a recent study done by a professor at Northwestern University named Amy Shrong Liu and her colleagues that was published in the 2012 Games for Health Journal. And I won't go deeply into the study, but it concluded, and this is a quote, ethnic similarity between video game characters and players, enhanced immersion, and several health outcomes. It was about, the, the game content was about teaching them to have better eating habits and exercise habits. Effectively embedding characters with similar phenotypic features to the target population in interactive health video game narratives may be important when motivating children to adopt obesity prevention behaviors. In other words, when kids playing games see characters who look like them, they become more immersed in the game experience and more receptive to the messages that the game is sending. In this case, that meant eating well and exercising more. Would that all messages we send them could be so positive. So let's agree to accept this one initial condition. People like seeing people who look like them in their entertainment. If we can agree on that, then everything else flows from the hard data. Let's check it out. Our world, which again, mostly I mean the United States or maybe the West, um, more broadly, it's changing. It has changed. In America, our first black president just won re-election, which actually, personally for me, that was a bigger deal than him getting elected the first time because it meant it wasn't a fluke. It wasn't just an aspirational thing. He actually did a good enough job that <laughs> the majority of the people wanted him back, right? Same-sex marriage was passed by popular vote for the first time in three states due in large part, it is agreed, even by those who opposed those developments, to changing demographics among the American electorate. And I'm happy to say that my home state of Washington was one of them. And of course, it's happening in Europe as well, as you guys know. Our country, like much of the West, is becoming browner and more tolerant regarding sexual orientation. And women were an enormous force at the ballot box in our last election, responding to a presidential campaign and multiple Senate and House campaigns that highlighted so-called women's issues as never before, possibly not always to their benefit. That's a joke that played really well in San Francisco. You guys may not know who these people are. Does anybody know who those two guys are? A couple, okay, quickly. These are two Senate candidates, Republican Senate candidates who ran last fall. Uh, who, both of whom insisted on talking about their opposition to abortion in all cases, even those of rape or incest. Um, recent polls, and I mean like this month, last month, May, both from CNN and from Gallup said that 78 or 79 percent of Americans think abortion should be legal in at least some circumstances. However, the guy on the left, Todd Aiken, who was running for Senate in Missouri, <laughs> In a television interview, said was asked about abortion cases of rape, and he said, he said, it's not a problem because, quote, if it's a legitimate rape, the, the female body has a way of shutting those things down. <laughs> the guy on the right is Richard Murdoch, who is running for Senate in Indiana, um, and in, in a televised debate, he responded to a question about abortion in cases of rape by saying that, quote, even when life begins in that horrible situation of rape, that is something that God intended to happen. I'm happy to tell you that neither of these guys got elected. And, how, and, and those statements were the main reason why, honestly. They turned what were expected to be easy pickup seats for the Republican Party into surprise victories by Democrats. Why? Because the Missouri, the Indiana, the America, the world that they think they're living in is not the world they're living in. That world is gone. This world has changed. Now naturally we would expect those demographic shifts to be reflected in our game playing audience and we would be right. First, let's look at age. <clears throat> Note the age breakdown. According to the Entertainment Software Association study of U.S. gaming demographic data in 2012, just 32% of U.S. gamers are under 18. 31% are aged 18 to 35. And 37% are over the age of 35, the single highest segment. 
Let me say that again. The single lowest demographic, age-wise, of people who play games is 18 to 35. How many times have you heard that talked about as the core, right? The single highest demographic is over the age of 35. Remember that the next time you hear a politician or a pundit refer to games as the exclusive domain of disaffected youth, which I don't know about over here, but in America that happens a lot. By the way, these statistics are also handy. Anytime you hear some, something like, uh, do you guys know about the, the Newtown shootings that happened in America in December? Where the guy, a guy came into an elementary school and killed 20 children, first graders, um, and a few teachers who were, and principal who were, who were trying desperately to save them. Um, and there's a, a writer for the New York Post named Mike Lupica who blamed that kind of mass murder after it on the fact that, that the guy who did the shooting, who was 20 years old, I think, was a gamer, quote unquote. The majority of the population of the United States are gamers. Well over 99% of them never hurt anybody. So keep that statistic handy the next time you hear somebody saying something like that. <clears throat> now, we don't have as much data on ethnic and sexual orientation of gamers at this point as we might like, but according to ZDNet in 2009, 15% of both Caucasian and African American populations in the United States played games. Excuse me, 15, 51, sorry. 51%, that's a majority for those of you playing at home. That figure went up to 63% for English speaking Hispanics in the United States. I don't know why this study didn't look at Asians. I wish it had, Asian Americans. Um, by the way, in America, as in more and more countries and other parts of the world, these populations are not negligible proportions of the entire population. According to the U.S. Census, as of 2011, non-Hispanic whites made, uh, made up 63.4% of the population, and that figure is dropping precipitously. African Americans made up 13.1%, and that number is rising. Hispanic and Latinos made 16.7% of the population, and that figure is rising. In some of the biggest states in America, like California and Texas, non-Hispanic whites no longer comprise a majority of the, of the population. And most estimates suggest the United States as a whole will be majority and minority. In other words, that group will be a minority of the population within the next 30 years. Oh, and since I know some of you are wondering, 1.4% of Americans are of Swedish descent. I don't have any information on their gaming habits, but I just pulled that out for you. The same ZDNet study looked at gaming across population concentrations and found that 56% of urban Americans played games. And by the way, that's where most Americans live, in cities. 53% of suburban Americans and 47% of rural Americans, that's almost half, in other words, given that population diversity, as, uh, as in most places, certainly in America, decreases as population density increases, playing games is not just popular across categories, it's more popular the more ethnically diverse the category is. And those stats are actually probably higher now than four years ago, since the total number of US gamers and gaming households has gone up. Keep in mind, four years ago, there was no iPad. There were no tablets. This has only gotten bigger, all these numbers. We know those things have played a significant part in getting more people to game. So imagine what those numbers must look like now. Now let's dive a little deeper into that last demographic for a moment, because I have some really good data on uh, Latino and Hispanic gamers. According to research done by Univision and GameSpot and Simmons, Latino and Hispanic American gamers are twice as likely to buy a game in the next 30 days than purchasers who are in non-Hispanic demographics. They are 54% more likely to buy it on the day of release. They are 15% less likely to say price is the main factor in their purchase decision. And they are 32% more likely to cite games as their primary form of entertainment. 32% more likely. Blog.Viacom reported that purchases of Xbox 360s by Hispanics went up 23% in 2012 versus 10% for non-Hispanic demographics. That's not a corroborated figure, by the way. I couldn't find independent co corroboration for that number, but that's, that was the published figure. Which kind of makes you wonder why pretty much all Hispanic or Latino game characters are either sidekicks or villains. I'd call that a missed opportunity. 
Now, let's talk about women. I like talking about women. We have strong data on women who play games, and it's conclusive. According to the Entertainment Software Association, in 2012, 40%, excuse me, 47% of all gamers were female. And among the most frequent game purchasers, which is, I think, how you'd have to define hardcore gamers, right? That proportion went up to 48% female. Adult women, quote unquote, one of the fastest growing demographics, represented a greater portion of the game playing population, which is to say 30%, than boys 17 and under, 18%. Again, nearly half of all gamers were female, and nearly one third of all gamers are adult women. According to an information services group study commissioned by PopCap in 2010, 55% of casual gamers were female. 55%. That's a majority, once again, for those of you scoring at home. And in 2012, 60% of all mobile gamers were female. That's an even bigger majority. And we all know, and if you don't, I promise you I can corroborate it, that console gaming is losing market share to mobile and casual at a rate sufficient to be scaring the hell out of every publisher and developer whose livelihood is tied inextricably to console games. Take my word for it. So, my conclusion from this is, women are not a small special market on the fringe of the core. Women are the new core. And given demographic trends in the West that we've already discussed, it's not hard to forecast the gender and ethnic, traje ethnic trajectory of the market moving forward. In other words, our audience is leaving us behind. Now, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to listen to some of the presentations yesterday of uh, some of the projects, uh, mostly from fourth year students, but also I sat in third and fourth year students, but I also sat in on the second uh, year, some of that. Um, and, and there was some really great stuff going on. But I did hear some discussion in some of the presentations of uh, presumed target audience demographics. At one point, somebody talked about um, uh, aiming a game at uh, the 20 to 40 segment, um, which is a little off from the way that we in America usually think of it. We usually classify that as 18 to 35. Um, and historically, we assumed that was the core, right? Core gamers meant 18 to 30, actually 18 to 34 year old, year old males. But that assumption, as we've seen, is now out of date. Uh, I can tell you that Microsoft, I can't give away, you know, the, the store here, but I can tell you that Microsoft user research at this point divides all gamers into six different categories and they're not, they have nothing to do actually with, with ethnicity or gender or anything like that. They have to do with, with game playing habits, why people use, what they use games for, you know, if they're parents, are they doing with kids? That's, there's, a, there's a little age involved. But uh, it was very interesting to me to note the last time they did a study on it that of the six categories that they had mapped out, they asked people um, that they, that they uh, uh, polled to uh, put a number of elements of the game experience, like 20 different elements, into order of priority to them. Three of those six ones put story at the top of the list. And in the other three, story was in the top three, and it was higher than gameplay, quote unquote, in all six of them. Now, I don't think that actually means that most people think story is more important than gameplay. Don't misunderstand me, because I don't think they really understand what gameplay means in some ways. But, it corroborates the idea that the games that we in the industry think the players, most players want to play, are not actually the games that most players want, necessarily. Because I can promise you, as someone who focuses on narrative, that the majority of this industry does not see narrative as anything like even in the top 10 most important things in a game experience. Not only is our audience leaving us behind, but we haven't even noticed that they've left. Some of us are trying to catch up. Two big projects I've worked on recently in Microsoft Studios both started out featuring non-white player characters, not because anybody mandated it, but because the teams looked at a myriad of possible visual ideas and simply decided that that choice made their protagonists more interesting, more singular, made them stand out more on a shelf. When you're looking for a way to make your product stand out in a crowded marketplace, 
that kind of choice begins to look pretty savvy, no matter what your perspective is. Then again, one of those projects was canceled for reasons having nothing to do with that. And the other one backed off of that choice because of casting concerns. They were, they were a Canadian company. They felt like they couldn't find um, enough good non-white actors to try to read for the role. I have an opinion about that, but I'm not going to share it. <laughs> but I am proud, as, as somebody who works for Microsoft, I'm proud that so many Microsoft games offer female and non-white player character options, especially Kinect games, which tend to give the player an avatar that's based on themselves. So automatically, they're getting that kind of, uh, uh, they're being served in that way. But I do know that in the absence of a compelling business case, even teams and companies who are dedicated to diversity in principle, and again, I think that's most of us. I think that's most of us. Even those of us who are dedicated to those things in principle can lose their nerve. So that's why I put this session together, to try to build the best available business case so that those of us who believe in diversity can walk into these discussions armed with more than just courage and a sense of what's right. And if you haven't had to have these conversations yet, if you're a student and you're still in that wonderful world where you get to do stuff just for you, Remember this, because hopefully pretty soon you're going to be out there working in the commercial industry and these issues are going to come up. And that brings me back to that little leap of faith that I mentioned earlier and the other reason that I put this session together. <clears throat> so a couple years ago, I went on this little tw kind of Twitter rant. I didn't plan it, but uh, I was reading some stuff about <laughs> uh, player characters and uh, people were tweeting stuff, female player characters, I saw men kind of bashing people who were saying they wanted those things, stuff like that. And it made me really angry because I had noticed that my daughter, who at the time was five, I think, um, had, and she was beginning to play games and she certainly was listening to music and she was watching movies and occasionally television shows and books. She, it had become clear, was not interested in stuff that didn't feature a girl as the main character, or at least it didn't have a really important girl there for her to kind of identify with, right? And so I sort of went off on Twitter about this um, because something just happened that made me think of it, and I, I was kind of angry about it at the moment, and I tweeted like 25 <laughs> tweets the way you do when you're writing a, basically an essay and, and you're tweeting it. And, and it, got, it got picked up by all of these places in the, in the gaming blogosphere that I didn't even know existed, honestly, and, and, and it's, it's not a credit to me, but like I didn't know there, there was a sort of queer gaming uh, online press, basically. They picked it up, feminist blogs, gaming blogs picked it up, and it was awesome like for me to discover that those things existed and for me to discover, more importantly, that actually they could be a megaphone for me or for you whenever we had thoughts about these kinds of issues that we wanted to get out there and wanted people to hear. My daughter is Caucasian, African American, Puerto Rican American, and even a little Native American on her mother's side. She wants songs sung by girls, she wants books and movies with girl protagonists, she wants games that have at least the option of girl player characters. She wants to see herself reflected in the art and entertainment media she consumes, because that facilitates the fantasy for her. I had that growing up. Most of the people in this room had that growing up. Probably a slim majority, but it's a majority. I never even had to think about it, and I didn't, honestly. It was everywhere around me. But my daughter has just as much of a right to it as I did. Every child does. Every person does. Now again, maybe you personally don't care about having the option of a player character who looks like you, but I bet you'd like to have the option. And I bet you'd like your kid to have the option, even if you don't have one yet. We're game players, everybody in this room, not just game makers and teachers and students of game making. We're game players, all of us. And options are the essence of realizing our fantasies in an inter interactive experience. And for me, that's what this all comes down to. Giving every one of our players the key to fully unlocking the fantasy that we work so hard to provide for them. Our industry, our art, and our business stand to gain in every sense simply 
by us holding a mirror up to our audience and reflecting back to them their own growing diversity. Our products will sell more units. The numbers show it to be true because we will be making them more relevant, our products, and more relatable to more players. Our interactive experiences will be more satisfying and more entertaining because the creative choices available to us as game makers will be richer and more numerous. And, oh yeah, while we're at it, we'll have done the right thing for our families, for our friends, and for our culture. And that's my presentation. I want to thank uh, the two ladies listed on there for their help in putting it together. Um, please feel free to email me or uh, follow me on Twitter and I'll follow you and we can have conversations about this stuff because I love talking about it. Thanks. So uh, we have some time for Q&A. If anybody has a question, please feel free to go up to that microphone up there and I'll do my best to answer it. <laughs> so yeah, um, uh, on the subject of people wanting to see characters that look like, like themselves in games, uh, in the game Just Dance 4, which I assume you have some insight in. in. I'm sorry, which one? In Just Dance 4. Just Dance 4. Just, oh, Just Dance, I'm sorry, thank yeah. you. Sorry, American accent here. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> Just Dance 4. Yeah, um, do you think the game would have a greater success if the characters were based on the body of the player instead of the song's performer? Or do you think that it's part of the fantasy of being the performer that makes it work so well? That's a good question. My, my guess is that, that assuming that the range of performers that are provided is sufficiently diverse, that's probably enough. Again, I think it's, it's not that people necessarily want to see themselves, because for, for all of us at times, gaming is an aspirational uh, activity, right? I mean, we like, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's why we have Marcus Phoenix, I mean, which is crazy to me, but I mean, you know, we have, you know, these guys who look like this, you know, because uh, for some of us anyway, that's a fantasy. And I, I think probably that aspect of it is enough. But again, if they, you know, if they only gave, say, three celebrities who, who uh, none of our performers, none of whom were, say, non-white, I mean, that's a real problem, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Say that they were given the choice of playing the performance or using a, um, well, I don't know, a model of their own body. Mm -hmm. Do you think that both modes would be used? I don't know. I think playtesting would answer that. My guess is that, the, that the, the, the performers, the famous performers, again, if there's sufficient diversity among them, probably would be enough to accomplish what you wanted and make players happy. But I'd want to test that. Right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want me to hum theme music of some sort while you walk? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, video games has often been uh, called the interactive movie. Um, do you think that we're still kind of stuck in that kind of way? Because like, if just like you showed, there are a lot of video games, you know, TV series that have a lot of uh, inclusivity in different kinds of characters, while um, AAA movies are very stuck in the norm. <laughs> Do you feel like it, we're still there? Like it's an interactive movie instead of looking at TV series as better? I think? In a word, yes. Okay. Um, uh, in other words, I mean, look, if any of you who know the history of um, cinema, for example, in, in the early days of cinema, basically what they did was they filmed plays. Right, because that was all they knew how to do. It was a new art form. They didn't have a new uh, uh, vocabulary, basically, for it. Um, and uh, then the camera started getting more, you know, moving and getting more experimental and, and they were doing things with it and it started to become a, really its own art form and then in the mid-twenties, sound hit and then once again everything got pulled back to square one because they had to have the actors sit at a table and have a microphone hidden in a potted plant, right, that they could bend over and they had to put a big booth over the, the camera because it made a ton of noise. And, 
And so then again, it was like another 20 years in, in Western cinema uh, in a lot of ways before, 30 years before it really started getting out of that. The same thing happened with games. It, it makes perfect sense, I think, that in the earlier days of storytelling in games, we would be borrowing conventions from other media. Um, and cinematics are very much that, right? Um, but it does not make a lot of sense as, as we gain the technical abilities to do things in a different way, to tell stories in a different way in games, that we keep clinging to that. And I personally am someone who much prefers the sort of Valve aesthetic of never having overt cinematics. Um, I, you know, I, if it was left up to me, I would avoid that choice whenever possible and hopefully always, you know what I mean? Now that doesn't mean that you can't, you, I mean, you can make that choice and good things can come of it. Like that, that's what Sa Saboteur was intentionally trying to be a sort of playable cinematic experience in the same way that say um, Uncharted um, is. And, and you can get a lot of cool things out of that. But for me, ultimately, we're never gonna be movies. Movies can do things that they do better than we can do, but we can do stuff we can do better than they can, right? We can do things they can't even think about. So. Um, if it was up to me, I would leave all that behind. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yes. Come on down, make a line. Uh, I'm just kind of curious about, uh, do you think there's a market for the complete opposite, I mean, complete opposite direction of having com purely abstract uh, games that basically don't resemble anything relatable? That's a that's an excellent question, and, and it's a I mean it's a question that's I think much bigger than than the purview of, of what my talk's about, but um, and I don't know uh, well, at the Game Narrative Summit in San Francisco a couple months ago. Uh, there's a gentleman named George Backer who used to work at Lionhead, um, who's terrific uh, uh, at what he does. I've worked with him a little bit, and he's really really talented. He gave a great talk about just that, highlighting games like Thomas was alone and stuff like that. You know where where the um, uh, the, the, the player, the, the characters were not personified in any real sense, right? They were sort of objects, not inanimate objects because you could move them, but they were objects that still somehow seemed to carry the emotional uh, content of, of characters, right? And, and I think that's really interesting. And I think um, it suggests to me that it is possible to do that in an effective way that people will enjoy, whether it would ever necessarily be huge on a commercial scale, it's difficult to say. Um, but uh, it would be interesting to see somebody try it, you know. I mean, I think my, my, my sad suspicion is that just like with abstract um, art in any other medium, that it, the, the audience would be limited, but it still would probably be pretty enthusiastic, I think. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question was kind of in the same area, because, I mean, early games, it was okay to have an abstract character like Qbert or right. Head Over Heels. Hey, Qbert's a character, man. That's not abstract. That's kind no, of... No, no, no. But uh, more, more, not very human, human looking. Yes. And uh, I wonder if, if you know if there's a trend uh, where we're moving more towards having characters which you can relate to and that's more and more important. Well, I think we're moving away from having characters. That's one of the problems. Right. I mean, the, the, the fact is that, that narrative games at this point in the way that they have existed in the AAA console space, which has mostly been their home, are very much an endangered species. And um, nobody, and I mean nobody, wants to put money behind that sort of thing right now because they're afraid that everything's going to, to mobile gaming and, and casual gaming and, and it doesn't look like a smart business opportunity to them. Now, knowing what I know and the stuff that I talked about in terms of having seen numbers about how important story is to most game players, I believe strongly that narrative games are gonna find a new home somewhere, but I don't know necessarily where that's gonna be. I kind of feel like it's probably gonna be in the tablet area, but I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, so, so, I mean, that feeds into, into your question in, in, in the sense that I think um, we are seeing more and more games that are not, right now, that are not really oriented around characters in the dramatic sense at all. Right, and that's, I mean, that's okay. I mean, obviously most of the stuff that you guys are making as students is, is that way, because there's a certain amount of, you know, work and money and, and all of that that goes into making even vaguely human sort of characters. But then, I mean, even to the extent of if you want to talk about non-human 
character characters. I mean, you could look at Mass Effect and all the different alien mm. characters in that, I guess, and, and say people are very accepting of that at this point, I think. You know? But the, the, there's a certain movement towards where the players really want something to relate to, whether it's in the story or the gameplay. So we... it. Yeah. It doesn't, I don't think it, it doesn't have to be about how they look, right? No. I mean, in Thomas was alone, they're just little rectangles. But um, it is, so, so it is a good point to say it really is, at the end of the day, more about how fully fleshed out the characters are. Are they, are they real people? And I use that word people in the, in the most general sense, you know. But you can achieve this by not focusing on the characters, but more on the narrative around the characters and make people relate to it. Yeah, you, it, getting people to feel about them yeah. and to feel like they are feeling, like, like, like those characters, no matter what they look like, are feeling, you know. That's how you do it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is high. Mm. <clears throat> it's not, Pull it down. Not right? adjusted I mean. to women, I think. <laughs> uh, okay. There's uh, a metaphor hi. there. <laughs> hi, uh, my name's is Rus. I come from Avalanche Studios. Yes. Uh, it's a pretty big uh, Swedish game developer. Uh, we make AAA games, and uh, we recently, or we've had on a number of occasions, uh, had the same, uh, or I've had the same experience as you talked about, where uh, female characters in the game are basically beaten down mm. due to profitability, or um, as in one case, due to ethics, because you really can't kill women, right? <laughs> so uh, my, my question is, do you have a strategy to make people believe these numbers? Because that's my biggest problem. Uh, to make people understand that uh, diversity is not necessarily, or gender equality is not necessarily uh, just something that I want into the game because I'm a woman, right. but because uh, I think it would be more profitable. Yeah, that, and that's the, that was the reason that I made this session. Um, because I'd never had, before I made this session, I'd never had any numbers of any sort. I felt the same way that you do, but I had no I, hard evidence to back, back my position up. And so... Um, I certainly welcome anybody who wants to to take the numbers that I've presented here um, and use them in, in your own life and work. Because my hope is, and I'd like to hear from anybody who does it, whether it works, you know, that armed with some of this data, that some of those paper tigers will kind of fold. You know, because I don't think there's a lot of um, uh, uh, strength behind them. I, th I think that, that the people who are looking for reasons um, to oppose this stuff are doing so just because they're, they're scared that it might not agree, be approved by the people above them. And I don't think it would take an awful lot to get them to be willing to take that chance. You know? um, in, terms of, in terms of strategies beyond having these numbers, um, the, the best one I can, okay, so I'll speak to, to the experience that I was talking about before. Um, and I'll tell you the mistake that I made, which is when we were having that conversation about the possibility of adding a, a female player character as well, and, and the marketing woman came back with the, 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 the very not useful numbers from the Gears of War 3 players. Um, the thing I didn't, I was so uh, kind of dashed by that, that it did not occur to me in the moment to do the thing which I really should have done and which might have made it work, which would have been to say, okay, let's find out exactly how much money and how much time it would take to do this. We're all saying, everybody's saying that, th that the one possible argument against it is that it might prevent us from being able to make our very tight schedule and that the resources it would take would be too significant, right? Okay, well, let's see if that's actually true. Instead of assuming it's true, let's talk to the developer, because I work for a publisher, let's talk to the developer and ask them to quantify in real terms what it would take, person hour-wise, resources wise, and then let's make an informed decision based on that. Because I don't think anybody ever gets to that point, honestly. Well, we did actually have uh, everything that we needed in place. So we yeah. had female skeletons, we had everything And they that we still needed, wouldn't let you do it? And they still wouldn't let us do it. That's just stupid. Because, <laughs> and I think that the only reason was because, um, and they made up some ethical sort of, and I'm, when I'm saying they, of course, I mean publishers, so right. please excuse me for... No, 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 yeah. <laughs> But, um, I used to work with developers. I know what publishers are. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I'm hoping that uh, talks like this that you held now and at GDC that th these kind of things, and this is more of a rant than anything else, so it's not a question at the end yeah. of it, uh, that that will <laughs> actually uh, make publishers and developers realize that we are a diverse community and it's not just, you know, 
uh, the developers seeing this that are creative or that want to be more creative and more sort of uh, inclusive, mm -hmm. but that the publishers also see it mm -hmm. because they're the ones who have the money at the moment. That's right. I agree. If, if that conversation trickles up to them, then I think that has a chance to make a difference. And honestly, my favorite, when, when I gave this talk in San Francisco, the line that I think was the most killer that I really loved was when I, was when I said, look around the room. Because even more than here, that audience looked like an Apple iPod ad. You know? I mean, it was so incredibly diverse in every possible sense. I was like, we are the ones making games. How come that's not in the game? You know? I mean, there's just no argument for it. But, any, but anyway, I, I share your hope. And I, I agree. I think we have to, you know, tweet and, and post and talk and, and hopefully they start getting the, the impression that, that maybe it's okay thing to try. It's great to see a guy behind this as well, as well because it's usually, uh, previously, it's only been women who right. lifted this. And unfortunately, we don't get taken seriously until a guy says the same thing. And so. that's why I did it, because I know, I know that's true and it's not fair. But, but that's why I felt it was important for somebody like me to say it. By the same token, I, I, after I gave it to San Francisco, I was criticized by some women who thought I was the wrong messenger. Can't really win. Well, anyway, know. thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Have a good lunch. <laughs>